if you're interested in like fantasy at all, whether it's games, books, movies, shows, um, tabletop RPGs, whatever it is, um, I would recommend just kind of checking out the loot first and, and you'll be able to find your, you know, kind of find your place. Like we've got architects, accountants, lawyers, um, you know, small business guys. Startup the entire concept is, is amazing. Not just the banners, but like the Ludverse and the realms and the caverns and the mounts and the fact that it's so decentralized and people are just like doing this voluntarily. You know, it's, it's, it seems like it could be a new basis of how organizations are structured. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Medallion Excellent podcast. Today, we have a special guest, uh, part of the Loot First, which is a project that I'm very excited about. Um, it is Banners for Adventurers, and he's going to tell us all about uh, the project. And we're going to know about the future prospects as well as, well as the current use cases. Um, so, so. Banners, tell tell me tell me about yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, just kind of a normal guy um, from uh, from Ontario, Canada. Uh, dad, two kids, a uh, small business owner in real life. But uh, I've been dabbling in crypto for know, maybe a couple years, um, and then the the loot drop happened last year, and it's sort of uh, to quote the Tim Shell, a, a major figure in the loot first. It, I got nerd sniped. Um, I got really excited about uh, what it could be and saw a bunch of people coming together and, and doing all kinds of different parts of, of world building and, and wanted to be involved in it as well and noodled on some ideas for a while and, and kind of arrived at Banners uh, in October of last year. And it's been, you know, all out, uh, all out nerd fest ever since. Cool. So Banners. So Banners is pretty much art for the loot first and this art uh just represents like the society and political layer of of the loot first and the various um projects associated with it is that correct is that a correct assessment yeah exactly it, it's a it's a layer of world building um so the loot bags that have you know the war hammers and the the holy chest plates and the divine robes sort of represent the the heroes and villains of the loot first um Banners represents kind of everybody else. So if there's, you know, mages, there must be non-magical people. If there's hunters, there's probably farmers. Um, there's no politicians necessarily outlined in loot. So putting together a, you know, a, a heraldry structure that is banners uh, gives you all of those sort of narrative hooks. Um, and we're just starting to get into it now with, uh, with writing and the, the character level of loot. Um, and banners is, is becoming like a, a big part of it now that uh, now that we're down to that sort of level of detail. Um, so yeah, it's it's narrative scaffolding. It's a, a society layer for loot, and then we wanted to 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 do art with it as well because um, that's that's the beauty of, of of heraldry and banners and crests and shields and all that kind of stuff. So we're right now um, in the midst of doing the painted banners, which is our first season of art. Um, so we had a painter in real life uh, hand paint every single component of all the banners. Um, and then we're writing a novel that uh, that outlines his journey and you know why those banners are hand painted and, and look the way they are. 
but uh, but banners is CCO, so um, somebody else could come in and, and take all of our data on chain, so they could take that and you know do their own season of banners, whether that's you know imagining the ancient banners, which is the the oldest houses in the in the deck, or you know doing pixel banners for a, for a platform game, whatever it may be. Um, they can come and do that. It's uh, it's it's fairly simple. It's the the connections between the houses where it starts to get complex and interesting. Let's let's hold off right there because before we get uh, into the details, I want to first let let let's have our user or have our listeners understand what the loot first is in the first place and why it's so significant. Yeah, so the, the Lootverse came out in August of last year um, by Dehoff. He dropped it sort of unceremoniously. Um, there was no roadmap. There was no details. It was eight items on a black screen um, covering what somebody in a medieval fantasy universe might wear. So there was, um, you know, crowns, robes, uh, chest plates, weapons, uh, chronicles and grimoires, you know, demon hide boots, dragon husk belts, and those came out and, and that was it. And the tagline was, you know, there's no, there's no use for these. It's free for others to interpret. Um, and a lot of people got uh, really excited about that. Um, and some of the big projects that came along very shortly after were realms, which was literally the land of the loot verse. Um, and then another project called crypts and caverns came in. So they were the, the places on the land linking to uh, the loot bags themselves. Um, and then since then, there's been a ton of projects come up. So there's uh, the Genesis Adventurers, which is sort of like a, a mathematical archaeological dig, tracing back the, the loot bags as they were launched, you know, back a thousand years through time to find out who the original owners were. Um, there's banners, like I mentioned, there's portals and passages, which is, you know, quick travel on the loop first. There's mounts, which is a series of you know, horses and dragons and mules and donkeys that, uh, that you can use to, to ride around in. Um, and I'm forgetting a bunch of them and I apologize for, for anybody from the loop first that's, uh, that's getting missed out. Uh, a tabletop game. Um, yeah, there's, there's just every, every facet of a you know, traditional fantasy universe is being worked on by somebody. There's musicians and writers and uh, animations and um, storybooks, comic books, it's, it's kind of all happening in the loop first. And it's a little bit, I think, under the radar for the, for the NFT community at hold, because it's not, it's not a fast process. Um, we're doing it in real time. Um, but I think, uh, you know, in the next one, two and five years, the loop first is going to be, it's going to be pretty surprising to a lot of people. And I want to highlight that all the projects that you just mentioned, they, this is being worked on completely decentralized. Like each of these projects are voluntarily working on different aspects of the loot first. And we're all coordinating together to just build out this loot first in this amazing decentralized way. Can you speak more on that? Yeah, we, we have a, uh, a weekly town hall um, in discord where we kind of all get together. And so, you know, we're, there's a guy named Standard Combo whose avatar is a like a, a stick a stick man. Um, you know, there's a lord of a few from Australia who's you know building realms. Um, so we we don't really know who any of each other are, but uh, we've all kind of become pretty great friends. Um, and we get together and we chat and we DM and do kind of everything like we would with uh, a normal business. It's just our you know our pictures and our avatars are you know, nerdy things instead of, uh, you know, Joe, Joe Schmo or whatever our names might be. We're, we're kind of LARPing as, uh, as world builders at the same time that we're world building. So it's, it's kind of, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I've actually, uh, I, I've actually met a few of the builders in the loot first, for example, uh, the leader of mounts, uh, that's where I actually got a lot of the information that I, I, I was introduced to about the loot first. Okay. And then, you know, I've been talking to you as well. And also um, I'm talking to Lord of a few on discord as well as um, there's a lot of Lords 
in the realms discord but i'm talking yeah, to so a, a few of them and also trying to get them out that as well if you if you own a realm um you get the designation lord uh within the loot first so lord probably needs like a, a lord he's lord of the lords i guess you could say but yeah he's a uh, he's a very big brain guy and he's like put uh, loot gaming kind of on his back um and he's doing it on Starknet, and and the things he's doing for Starknet is, and the, and the entire realms team is pretty incredible. Um, when uh, when that gets launched, I think it's going to be quite spectacular. Yeah, let's go into Starknet for a little bit because Starknet is an Ethereum layer two, and for those of you who don't understand what a layer two is, a layer two is pretty much uh, allowing unlimited transactions at the cheapest uh, rate possible on top of ethereum's blockchain and all the transactions are rolled up um into one large transaction and submitted at some point um so let's let's go into to that for a little bit um we'll... sorry can you say that again it cut out just a little yeah let's let's go into uh ethereum's uh let's go into startnet and ethereum's yeah. layer two uh so how do, what, what how would you compare Startnet uh, compared to like Arbitrum and Polygon and different other layer twos? Like what? Why is uh, Startnet uh, the chosen layer two for the Loopverse? Um, it's a it's a good question. I'm I'm in all honesty probably not the guy to answer it. Um, my my knowledge of of those things like I'm not a uh, a super technical person. I'm more of the the lore and media and world building um, guy, I guess you could say. But um, having followed along with Realms kind of since the beginning, they they'd originally um, started on, I believe it was Arbitrum, um, and then they did a massive pivot when they they heard about uh, uh, about Starknet, and they've been kind of full bore ever since. Um, and in going through, they just released their uh, their new sort of white paper um, and the, the called the master scroll. And if you go through it and you start to see some of the gameplay, um, so every realm has uh, various resources. Um, some realms have more, some have others. Um, and then crypts and caverns are layered on top of the realms and then they have additional resources. There's gonna be uh, rating between realms. Um, you'll be able to sell your resources, buy more resources, build things. Um, so it, it's got, it's almost like um, like civilization uh, the game, and when you start to kind of zoom in on that and see just how many transactions it is, um, like we're talking you know millions of transactions over over a period of time, um, and I think for them the only the only viable option was was Starknet um, because even at you know a couple pennies like it might be on on Polygon uh, per se. Um, it's it's not going to be sustainable, and they, and they've been pretty public and and have been for a while about their goal of having, you know, one million users uh, of the game, and so I think um, Starknet is is just the the best and only option for for the type of scale that they're that they're aiming to achieve, um, and having been following along, I, I little doubt that they're going to be able to do it. Yeah, so based on what I know about Startnet, uh, Startnet is even able to build a ma machine learning, um, uh, I, I guess, virtual machine on on the blockchain, which is pretty amazing. So, and they're, they're supposed to be able to do it at an extremely cheap rate. So if a, a, a multiplayer on-chain on game like uh, Lootverse or like loot versus going to be like really sustainable over the long term. Like definitely having each transaction be as cheap as possible is definitely the way to go. So, um, could you explain how interacting with absolutely everything is is a blockchain transaction? Um, can you can you clarify that question a little bit? Uh, so in in what in the loot first like what whenever you interact with anything uh that's a blockchain transaction right like 
For example, if your avatar picks up a coin, that's a blockchain transaction. If they kill a dragon, that's a blockchain transaction. And you need those transactions to be as cheap as possible. Is that correct? For sure. Yeah. Now, like as of today, um, we like realms, uh, they're just in their testing. Um, there's another project called loot MMO, which we've seen some demos of, um, and we're just starting to, to get on to that. Um, but the, the first, I think, major game that that's come on is uh, the Crypt game, which is a dungeon rating game. Um, and so there was, you know, a handful of dungeons and they had, you know, various, they required various combinations of loot bags and it required a lot of offline coordination, but you're right. Then you would show up and, um, you know, attack it with your loot bag and deal a certain amount of damage to a certain, um, component of the dungeon. Um, and so a guy named Loot Hero was, was quite active in, uh, and taking on the dungeons, but um, they started out on Ethereum and then they moved to Polygon for their, moved their transactions to Polygon um, so that they could have gasless rating. Um, but all of that is recorded on chain. Uh, and then the Lootverse has a pretty, um, a pretty good ethos of, of taking things that are on chain as uh, the foundation of canon. So, you know, there'll be stories written about the, um, you know, the, the temple of, of power that, uh, that was taken down by, by a loot hero, for example. Um, and those things will start to, to be the foundation for future stories as we move from, you know, kind of low detail to high detail or, or low fidelity to, to high fidelity, which is sort of a catchphrase, uh, in the loot first, but, um, the block, yeah, the blockchain is sort of the basis of it all. Um, and we're also, um, I'm involved with a project called the open quill, which is the, I guess, low literature arm of, of the loop verse. Uh, we've been giving no strings attached grants to, to writers. And we, we just closed round two, uh, which had, which saw us pull in uh, a little over a hundred thousand words through two rounds of, of written content and really good written content as well. Um, and now we're in the, you know, sort of revision and editing process. Uh, and when that's done, we'll be minting those to the blockchain. So we'll have actual loot stories, uh, you know, cemented on the, on the blockchain for, for all eternity. Um, and that's kind of, I think what the blockchain is to the loopers. It's, it's twofold. So at the sort of art and lore layer, it's, um, the, the pouring of the foundation, so to speak, the immutability, immutab immutab I can't say that word right now. Um, and then the gaming side of it is the, yes, thank you. <laughs> Tripping over my tongue here. I'm getting too excited. Um, and then there's the gaming layer, which is, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of transactions that, that need to be computed, uh, in a public and, and viewable way. Um, and those are the things that are going to happen with realms and, um, you know, further down the line, fluid MMO and, and crypt game, for example. So it's kind of twofold. The blockchain, the blockchain serves two purposes for the loopers. Yeah. All right. I think that's enough uh, foundation laying. Let's get into the Banners project. So Banners, as you explained, is a political and societal layer of the of the loot verse. Correct. Could you uh, expand more on that? Yeah. So if you um, like if you think to, um, you know, any of your your favorite fantasy universes, whether it's Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, um, it's the the politics that sort of sets the stage for a lot of what goes on. So, you know, the the Starks hate the Lannisters and that causes a thing. And then the Starks have banners like the Tullys and the the Umbolts or, or whatever, and they have to call their banners to go to war against the other banners. And when you lay a layer like that out, um, you start to get a lot of surface area for, for conflict and uh, you know, betrayal, love, lust, um, et cetera politics and all of those things are a hook that you can hang uh, hang stories on and that was our our interest in in the loop first was you know we we watched game of thrones and you know threw our drinks at the tv in season eight because we we hated it um you know we watched lord of the rings and were enthralled but then you know looking back it's kind of you know bland storytelling if you if you scrape away the the details of uh, the world building details. And, um, we wanted to be a part of that and sort of our, our idea was, you know, let's, let's build this layer of people 
um, that span the entire entirety of the loot verse that adventurers, the, those carrying loot bags, are going to encounter. Um, so you know they get to a town, and you know what kind of town is it? What what's their you know history of industry? Who do they fight with? You know what you know what things have happened in their history, um, and you can start seeing all the tendrils of, of history uh, kind of go through through the loot first. And that's that's what Banners was intended to be. Very cool. So you're also a art project. Um, so expand on that as well. Yeah. So we launched Banners um, and it, it started out as a text only NFT. Um, so we, we said, here are your three elements. Um, and it could be a mythical, uh, an animal, a weapon, or an item. So you might have a minotaur and a war hammer and a coins or fire or something. Um, and those, those started out as text only NFTs. We don't specify, you know, you know, this, you know, if you have a bear, you're, you know, a, a politician or a king or anything, we don't specify any of that. That's up for, for people to take and interpret how they see fit. Um, but we wanted to do an art project and visualize these. Um, so if you think to, you know, you go to LARP events or castles in, in Europe, uh, whatever it may be, um, it's rich with heraldry. So there's banners hanging everywhere. You see them on the crests of, of shields and uh, books, etc. And so we wanted to create the painted banners. And we had this, uh, this painter that we've known in real life for quite some time, who's quite talented. Um, and we tasked him with painting the banners. And so everything, um, that we're doing is hand painted on paper uh, and parchment and then scanned in. So we'll, we'll, we'll digitally assemble them because it's impossible to hand paint that many banners. Um, but all of the elements themselves are hand painted and the finished effect, it, it looks like a manuscript. Um, we're calling it a tome of senses. So it's a collection of all, all houses of the realm. And the inspiration for that is, uh, if you think back to, I think it's uh, season one of Game of Thrones, Ned Stark's kind of in the in the library, flipping through the the genealogy book of the realms and looking at, I think it was the hair color um, of Joffrey Baratheon and how it didn't match up with the other Baratheons. So we're not doing hair color, we're doing the, the houses um, in the Tome of Census. And then we've started writing a, a novel that is the story of that painter. And, you know, how he, he how he got the job to paint all the banners, why he was um, open to, to do such a, a grandiose task. Um, and then there's some other things. I won't spoil it for anybody, but um, he's got some other reasons to be traveling the realms and, and basically visiting everywhere, um, you know, looking for something. So... So let's, let, let's put it all together. Um, so pretty much uh, Banners is a world building project on the loot first. And you guys are focused on the society layer, which means like the farmers, the, the different workers who are not like the warriors, but uh, just what, what are they called? Uh, N NCPs, uh, N NPCs, NPCs, NC NPCs. Is that correct? Yeah, and you, you bring up yeah, a great so point. So they're just uh, non-player. Yeah, you bring up a, a great point. So we we identified early on that, that banners could be um, sort of the, the motivations for NPCs. Um, but as we started thinking about it, um, and, and we're a bit strange, we're always looking at the, the story behind the heroes and everything we watch. And there's a really interesting um, layer of, of NPCs in traditional media. We did a thread on it uh, a while ago, um, and one of the examples was there's a a cave troll in the Lord of the Rings that's uh, attacking Frodo. Um, and if you if you do a screen grab, there's this you know massive troll, but he's got uh, a chain, a broken chain, and a collar on him. And the question we always ask is like, who put that there? Why did they put that there? When did they put it there? Um, and if you start asking those questions, you start flowing back that you know maybe there was you know, this war between the trolls and somebody else and they, you know, captured them or it was, you know, the trolls were ravaging fields or something and they needed to like contain them, whatever it may be. But there's, there's stories behind 
all of the main character quests. And we're really interested in those. And if we're building this, you know, global decentralized fantasy world, um, we'll have the room and the, the opportunity to explore those stories. Um, and you're seeing that a lot more with traditional media right now too. So for example, um, within the Star Wars universe, um, in the original movies, Boba Fett, I think had eight minutes of screen time and, and two lines across two feature length films. And now he's got two seasons or one season shot and another season booked. Um, that's just his story, the book of Boba Fett. Um, so he was one of those sort of ancillary, almost NPC characters in the original sort of Luke Skywalker saga. And now they're drilling down and, and telling his entire story across, you know, eight or 10 one hour episodes. So we think banners represents sort of that book of Boba Fett is to loot, uh, um, loot is to Star Wars. Got a lot there and I'm trying to figure out like which question to ask because I could go the banners route or the Boba Fett route. And um, let's talk more about uh, banners. Uh, so as far as these NPCs, are there any quest givers? Like, uh, so when I play traditional uh, or when I play video games, the NPCs usually have one or two who can give you a quest, like go go fetch this, and then I'll give you this armor or whatever. Is is do you, do you, have you guys accounted for that type of thing? Yeah, for sure. Um, and again, that's that's another brilliant question because um, in a traditional game, whether you're you know playing Witcher or Zelda or, or Elden Ring or whatever, um, you have that interaction with the with that. NPC and they, they want you to do something. Banners begs the question, you know, why did that person do that thing? Um, where did they come from to, to meet that person? You know, what's their motivation for, for having them do that thing or get that thing? And, you know, could you play as that person? And if you look at, if you flip sort of the, flip the mirror from the main character perspective and think of the main character as the NPC and your quest is to, you know, convince that person to go and get that thing for you. It, it sort of changes your focus on it. Um, you know, the, the main character is kind of a matter of perspective. Um, and I think there's all kinds of interesting stories in the traditionally NPC uh, level of characters. Um, and even from a game bring perspective, I mean, the quests are, are, are literally only starting to be built right now. So we don't, we can't say that, you know, banners is those quest givers at this point, but um if you think, you know, to a massive online game, you know, sometimes you want to, you know, put on your Hyrulean shield and, and go battle the bad guy in, in Hyrule. Um, but other times you might just want to, you know, grab a club and, and, you know, smash some travelers across your bridge for a little while too. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of different angles that um, in something like loot that you can, you can explore that previously weren't available. And I think that was starting to come out with, with video games and indie titles and, and smaller games. Um, but the AAA studios, I mean, it takes, you know, three to five years to put out, uh, you know, a massive, a game like that. Um, and there just isn't the, the ability to zoom in on those things. Whereas, you know, in loot, people are building, you know, composable, uh, types of plugins that you can do that. So somebody that has the house of, you know, dragon gold and fire, um, you know, maybe they can come to the game and build their own dungeon where if you, you know, beat the dragon's fire, you get a bunch of cold gold at the end. Or if you're the, you know, the, the troll tower lightning house, you've got a, a level of your own that, uh, that people have to come and, and beat. Um, and maybe you play as the troll, as the boss that, the hero is, is taking on at the end. Uh, maybe the bad guy is, is a playable character. So at this moment, like are all, do all the NPCs have quests or only selected NPCs? So there's no, that question's a little bit early. So like there's not, there's not a game out yet that has adventuring and questing. It's, it's currently in development. Um, loot only came out, uh, just about 11 months ago. Um, so 
the, the few people that are working on those projects, uh, Standard Combo with Loot MMO and Realms uh, with the Realms game, they're starting to do those things. Um, and so the first iterations, I think, are going to be, um, you know, fairly, fairly straightforward. Like, take your loot bag and go, you know, collect this thing from, you know, this scary mountain or something like that. Um, but those are going to evolve over time. And as the ability to have user created quests and levels and characters come in, we think that's where banners is really going to slot into the loopers um, quite nicely because it's got a, an intrinsic and interpretive set of uh, you know, goals and ambitions and, and reasons for doing those things. So if you're the house of, you know, rat mushroom poison, you probably operate a little bit differently than, you know, the, the horse, the horse fire longbow, for example, um, even just thinking about the combinations of elements that might be on your house banner, you can start to develop a sort of a character personality in your mind about how they might be. And when you bring those to the table, you, you allow, um, you know, there's a guy named Pinky in the loot first, and he's sort of the, the agent of chaos and he loves doing sort of things against the grain, so to speak. So, you know, if he ends up with, um, like I said, you know, dragon rat poison, um, he might have all kinds of chaos that he could wreak, um, and have a narrative reason for doing it because of, uh, because of his banner. So let's pause right there. Cause I'm sure a lot of listeners are hearing you say like dragon rat poison and like, what does that even mean? So what you're talking about is how a uh, loot NFT is structured, right? Which is uh, structured by the elements uh, or the ID, the three elements, the color and style and the features. So when you say like uh, dragon, dragon, whatever poison, uh, that those are the three elements, correct? Of the L right. NFT. And yeah. So that that's a banners NFT. There's three elements, um, position one, position two, position three, uh, a color, a hem style, so it can be single, double, or, or triple point. Um, and then they can be patterned or solid color. Um, and so you'll be able to see some of them. And if you go to our uh, our Twitter page, at Banners NFT, uh, and just scroll through our media our media reel, you'll be able to see a bunch of examples that we've been, we've been posting. Um, so we specify that the, the main thing is the, the three elements are in heraldry, they're called charges. Uh, that sort of defines your house. Um, and what you choose to define those as is, is entirely up to you. So um, there's 75 different elements. Um, and I mean, even narratively, the, the way that they, they can operate is, is much different than from one to the other. So, you know, if you have, you know, dragon, dragon, dragon fire, you're probably a pretty proud, you know, traditional dragon house. But if you have something like um, dragon trident longship, um, you might be some sort of, you know, seafaring dragon that uh, that poaches sailors, uh, you know, off the coast of somewhere or something like that. Um, the monsters may or may not exist. It might be the personality of the people uh, that you know live in the seaside village and fly that as their banner. Um, and then, and then we have a class that we call the ancient banners. Um, so those are. Uh, any banners that have elements that are animals or items of the earth. So non man-made things. So, um, it could be lightning, fire, um, berries, trees, mountains, that kind of thing. There's, I think 1500 ancient banners and those represent the oldest houses on the, uh, on the realms. Um, but there's a whole interesting class of things there too. So if you have, um, you know, mountain, mountain, bear, um, you know, you might picture them living in, you know, a place like Colorado or, or, or Alberta in the Rockies kind of thing. Um, and you know, what their motivations are, what their, what kind of things they do in their day-to-day -day life as having those versus somebody that maybe has, um, you know, scorpion, scorpion fire. Um, you can start to see the differences that's, that's right there. Right. So, um, so just, just to expand on that just a little bit more, these, these, these NFTs, they're text only, but these texts inform like the different projects, like what, um, 
what to build around it. Is that correct? Is that a proper assessment? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it, it tells you, like, if you make a, a visual banner, it, it should have those colors and, and those elements on it. Um, but beyond that, we don't, we don't prescribe anything. Um, so if somebody comes in and wants to do their own art version, um, they can. And so right now we have the, the text only NFTs. Um, we're launching what we're calling sort of the first season, the painted banners. Um, and that's from us, but anybody else could come along as an artist and do any version. They could, you know, generate them with uh, AI art. They could, you know, make pixel elements and, and assemble, assemble them quite easily. Um, maybe they take a subsection of banners and do, um, you know, fantasy realist type art. Um, maybe they envision the monsters as part of a bestiary project. There's a lot of different ways that people can take banners and, and, and do something with it. Um, and banners is entirely CCO. Um, so we encourage and, and promote the use of them. Um, and we're starting to see them pop up in stories, which is really cool. So I think as the stories start to get written and then they start to get illustrated, um, banners is going to move uh, quite a bit, you know, into the, the visual sphere. sphere. Um, and I think with us launching the, the painted banners, that's going to help a lot too. We knew we were early to the loop first, like the most important things were, you know, let's get some land realms. Um, you know, you kind of need dungeons and, and, and things like that. We're, we knew we were further down the, the, the line of things that get thought about in terms of uh, world building, but um, we wanted to put it out and, and it's so much fun to play in. Um, you know, we, you know, DM with other people, they, they might say like, Hey, we're, we're, I have this character and they're going to go raid a town. Um, and they're in this part of the realms, like what kind of, you know, what kind of banner or what kind of town would that be? And then we, you know, think about banners together and, and it, it starts to craft, uh, stories and characters, um, which is it just, it, it's so much fun, um, you know, for a kind of an art and symbol nerd, uh, and fantasy nerd like myself. All right, so let's expand more on, um, on, on, on the art and the branding and the symbols. Uh, so, uh, so Carl Jung, right? He wrote a whole book on symbols and meanings and pretty much symbols, uh, represent, uh, things that are not easily described. So when you are creating these banners to describe, uh, these loot first NFTs, like what's what's your your i guess from an art di direction perspective like what's your thought process or what's your process yeah so the the first first and foremost um was the the style so they're they're hand painted um in real life by like a professional painter so they and we did that to match the story that we're writing which required there to be a tome of census. So, you know, one guy gets commissioned to paint every banner in the realm. He's got to travel and go see them and paint them. Um, so that all sort of jives. Like the, the reason we're using that style is because of our story and the story is written based on the style and that kind of matches. Um, in real life, the painter, um, you know, did a lot of research on, on you know, traditional heraldry, um, you know, different cultures, uh, you know, and how they symbolize things, whether it's, you know, Mesopotamians or um, Atlantis or Greeks or Romans, whatever it might be. Um, so we pulled a lot of inspiration from, from, from that. Um, but I think the important thing to note is that the painted banners that we're releasing, although it's a, a visual NFT, it's still narratively through the eyes of one person. So we're not, we still haven't prescribed what, um, you know, a mermaid might look like on a banner, for example. It's just what Loman Dreisler, the character in the story, sees and paints. So somebody could still come along and completely re envision a mermaid um, and how it might look on a banner. And maybe they don't even paint the banners, maybe they're doing. Um, you know, the, the shields that their, their soldiers might carry in battle. And maybe it's a different version of a, a mermaid. So 
even though we're, we're coming out with the first visual representation of the text only original NFTs, um, it's still not prescriptive. It's, there's a narrative reason why they look that way. But, um, but to your point, um, there's, there's a lot of symbology, symbology. And as you get into heraldry, there's a, a lot of reason. So, you know, the stance that a lion has means different things, the way they're looking, uh, you know, whether it's Dexter or sinister means a different thing. Um, all of that has meaning and within the loop verse, you know, our, our, our idea was that, um, it made a lot of sense to have these visual representations because, um, depending on what your take on it was, you know, maybe literacy wasn't, wasn't, you know, prolific throughout the, uh, throughout the, the realms and, and people needed and different languages as well. So people needed easy ways to identify, you know, who was something. So if you came from, you know, across the, across the entire world and you had, uh, you know, uh, a horse on your banner and you went to some other place that had a horse, you might be able to have some commonality there and recognize that, um, you know, you guys are sort of, uh, distant cousins and you might, you know, find, uh, find respite there if you're on a long journey or, or something. So, um, I, our favorite part of the whole thing is that symbols are, as you suggested, open for interpretation. Um, and it, it makes us super happy when other people interpret them in different ways. Um, and so we're only on, I think month, I don't know, eight of banners. Um, and like, I would, I would totally take a time machine to five years from now and see what people, us included have, have started to build and visualize on banners. Cause, um, it's, it's just so much fun and you can do so much with it. Um, you know, the symbols make characters and the characters make symbols and, um, it's just a, a flywheel of, of cool stories and characters. So the NFT project is 25,000, uh, items, correct? Like it's a collection of 25,000 NFTs. Correct. Yeah. Which is, I, I guess big, um, by NFT standards. Um, I've never really, um, I've never heard like great logic on why 10 K was sort of the, the de facto number for NFT collections. Um, so we know we're bigger than that. We weren't, we're not meaning to be, um, a, a traditional NFT collection in that sense. The reason we're 25,000 is because it gave us the, the narrative complexity that we wanted. So at, at 25,000, um, NFTs, each banner through something as, um, low connected as a single element shared with another one, right up to having a twin house or a family house. Um, there's a minimum of 3000 connections that each banner has to other banners in the collection. And so that, that works out to, you know, three out of 25,000. Um, that gives you sort of surface area to, to tell stories. Um, so for example, if you had fire horse bear and fire frog longbow, for example, um, you know, why do those two share a fire? How do they revere the fire as part of their symbols? How do those two houses view each other? Are they friends? Are they enemies? Um, did somebody split off and start, you know, the fire longbow house from the, the fire bear house? Um, it just, it begs a million, a million questions. And that's, that's why we're 25,000. Um, we're not terribly expensive, but, um, down the road, there's going to be, there's going to be, um, uses for banners and boosts and, um, all kinds of things that you'll be able to do with them. Um, for example, like we're working on a game right now called call the banners, which is a, a social, it's more like a social discord game, but, uh, it's, in future iterations, you'd be able to check in with your banner and get additional boosts to, to play that. Um, it's a very, um, low, uh, low difficulty game. It's more of a social hangout. So there's two castles, um, generals are nominated, they're given some money and then they have to buy cell swords to attack the other castle. And there's no rules about who can attack, uh, who can't attack. It's, it's literally like, 
you know, here's here's a hundred coins, go attack that castle. The player could take the coins and not attack the castle and turn around and attack the hand that just fed them. Um, it's very very low rules and low structure. Um, and what comes out of it is, is just a lot of fun and shit posting and meme posting and, and stuff like that. But um, your attack strength will be in the future affected by your banner. So if you have two weapons on your banner, you'll have more attack power. You might command more money from the generals that are trying to pay you to, to attack their enemy. So two weapons on your banner means out of those three elements, two of them are weapons? Yep. And you could also or, have a, a three-weapon banner. Verify that? Yeah, so there's four categories of elements. Oh, okay. there's, there's mythicals, which would be, you know, your dragon, kraken, mermaid. There's animals, so, you know, your stag, horse, bear, uh, scorpion, frog, peacock, etc. There's weapons. Um, so some a lot of the loot first weapons are represented on banners as well. So katanas, warhammers, swords. Uh, we also have, you know, catapults, longbows, um, gauntlets, etc. And then there's items. So the other things that might show up on a banner, but aren't one of the previous three categories So things like uh, tower, mountains, coins, chains, um, lightning, uh, sun, moon, stars, anything that doesn't fit those other categories ends up there. Um, and so there's 75 total elements and your banner is, a, is three of those. And so the connections, um, start to differ. So if you if you end up with two or three weapons, the suggestion might be that you're, you know, particularly aggressive or good at defending yourself or good at raiding or, or whatever it may be. For the Call the Banners game, um, you'll get additional boost to your attack strength by having by checking in as a two weapon or a three weapon house. And then we'll also rank the weapons as within that as well and, and give additional boost, but we're still sorting out those details, but that's one example of of how um, the banners are going to be used, sort of in a more practical sense. Interesting. So uh, let me let me try to sum up everything that you've you've said so far. So banners are uh, artistic representations of loot nfts which are just text right and uh other projects can integrate banners into their projects and and pick a specific i guess house i will call it right yep and um and then and, and then that banner is kind of kind of represents the brand of a particular house is that a good summary that's yeah that's pretty good um from from the narrative fantasy side of things, um, banners is like, um, you know, the the werewolf banner or the direwolf banner for Starks, um, you know, the dragon banner for Lannisters and Game of Thrones. We've just, instead of having, you know, seven or eight main characters, we've made considerably more to, to handle the volume that sort of the loot versus is ex expecting to have. But you're right. It is a, a brand... Um, it might be indicative of an industry. Um, it might be from a, a number of people. It might, it might represent an entire city. It might represent something as small as a village. And it might even be as small as like a, a single family living in a, you know, maybe they, they run a sorcery academy like, uh, like Hogwarts. Um, that might be, you know, Sorcerer Tower Lightning, for example. So it's, it's whatever you want it to be. It's just a little bit of structure to get the ball rolling creatively. Um, and then once you sort of envision what, what your banner might be, you start to figure out who your enemies might be, who your friends might be, who your trade partners might be. Um, and you can start to, you know, it could be a foundation for a guild system. Um, and all of this operates within sort of a religious isn't the right word, but it's, I guess, the best analogy. Um, there's an order structure within loot. So there's 16 orders um, of, and they're like of power, of deception, of uh, fury, of rage. Um, and that kind of acts as like a, an organization structure. Um, sort of columnar, but we, we put banners in and, and our purpose is to kind of muddy those waters. So 
you might have, you know, a twin house that is, you know, assigned to the order of fury. Um, and then your twin who has the same elements as you do, uh, which would be a, a fairly significant bond might be of power. Um, and then you're kind of at odds because you're, you're, you know, very tight houses, but you come from different, you know, orders and, and how does that play out? You know, like if you go to, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, like, does, you know, the Fury guy reach across the table and, and, you know, start a fight or, or whatever, right? Like there's, there's a million, a million things that could happen there. And it's really interesting to, to game those out and see how that plays out as opposed to, you know, maybe the more, <clears throat> um, I always use the orcs from Lord of the Rings as an example. Like they're just, they're just kind of like super bad dudes and they don't, you know, there's not a ton of emotion. There's not a ton of, uh, motivation for for why they do the things they do um we're saying like you know what if the orcs were both you know on the good side and the bad side and they had different religious makeups and they had different banners like how might an orc behave then um and how might they behave when they ran into another orc that you know had different you know religious political and societal structures behind them wow so it, the, the 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 entire concept is is amazing. Not just the banners, but like the Ludverse and the realms and the caverns and the mounts and the fact that it's so decentralized and people are just like doing this voluntarily. You know, it's it's it seems like it could be a new basis of how organizations are structured. Like just just the way that the Ludverse is progressing seems like it could be a way for us to restructure society in a way that's decentralized and incentive based right because i guess i don't like i don't know if you're getting paid like and and i don't know how you would be getting paid like because from what i see the incentive structure is for you to make money off minting the nfts right or or am i wrong no you're entirely right yep that's our 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 funding model i guess you could call it um as for organizing society um it's a big question is even though i've spent this whole interview talking about organizing a society within within the loop first um but the like the level of um I guess maybe accomplishment um, of the loopers is like, it's super exciting. And I think you're right. I think there is, I think there is something to it. Um, and if you flash forward a year from now, we're going to have, you know, probably a couple animated series. We're certainly going to have at least two to three games um, online and playing. We're going to have a book printed, potentially published by, a, you know, a traditional publisher and, and on sale in bookstores. Um, so, like what we've been able to to do in that relatively short period of time is is pretty cool and it would be awesome to you know distill that and probably the best person to to do that and maybe you can do a follow up interview would be would be Tim Shell um who's the leader of the Genesis project but uh, sort of a community leader at large um because you're right there is there is something sorry if you can um set that up I'd love to interview him for sure yeah, I'll uh, I'll shoot him a DM. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool what we've been able to do, and everybody kind of just does their own thing, gets together and chats out ideas, and then and then goes back. It's really um, progress focused. I find um, you know we don't get <clears throat> we don't get bogged down in in, in anything really. We everybody just kind of like goes full bore ahead, and there's a a really high level. I think of respect among the different projects as well um which is not uh like not to say that there would be disrespect but everybody just knows that you know like you know lord of a few for example is like you know absolutely crushing it on realms and you know when he comes up for air and, and updates us it's like awesome it's it's just incredible like no like there's no nobody needs to you know, watch over him. Nobody needs to watch over us or, or mounts or crypts and caverns or, or whatever it is. Um, 
I, I think everybody just rose to their to their level and and is doing it for um, I think both financial but also passion reasons and I, I think that may be part of the the secret sauce as well um, because the yeah. the amount from my of, view this or no no go ahead. <clears throat> I was rambling. You, you, you go. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, no, I was saying, like, from my view, it seems like there, this is a new uh, monetization model. And I don't know if you're familiar with all the monetization models, but there's like e-commerce and there's um, what else at the advertising model and there's subscription model. And this new decentralization incentive based model is it, it, it is specifically uh, attached to the blockchain and pioneered by people in the blockchain. And it seems like it's a way for progress in society to be made uh, without like forcing anybody, without like having, like people can pretty much focus on their passions and, uh, and, and in a decentralized community, like everyone kind of just like, holds each other up is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think that's a really neat and sort of wise take on the loot first. Um, especially, you know, the last the last several months I've been involved with the uh, the Open Quill, which is sort of the, the literature arm of the loot first um, and has designs to, to go on to be sort of a Web3 um, written, written word project. Um, but we we gave ETH to people who wrote stuff. So, you know, if you weren't uh, an artist, like, you know, the NFT space is, is decent for artists because there's a lot of visual media, um, or you're not a game dev, um, you could you could always write something. Like, everybody's got ideas if they're interested in a particular uh, universe. Like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, D&D people, um, you know, other fantasy nerds kind of in the loop first. So all you needed was an idea um, and to spend some time putting that idea down and, and honing it and submit it to the open quill program. And, and you got ETH for that. Um, and this is like, we're only, we've only just finished round two. Um, like it's kind of just getting started, but, um, but you're right. The idea that you can show up to the loot first, say, you know, I can do this, this, and this. Um, there's a, there's a place and, uh, you know, a remuneration for you in there somewhere. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I was going through your white paper and you mentioned two things that I, I want clarification on. And this is more uh, based on the story of banners rather than like the te any technicalities. Um, so you mentioned the Great War and also the Divine City. Can you uh, explain what those are in yes. the loop first realm? So the Great War um, probably should be referred to a bit more generally as the, the cataclysm. So er, in the early on days of loot, um, a few people really dug into the contract. And so the items can have a greatness level um, that can any, be anywhere between one and 20, but all all items do not exceed 20, even though there's things in the contract that suggest that they can go beyond that. And there's even a, a hidden lore in the contract as well. So there's, there's lore A and lore B, and those show up in the item. So you can have the, the crack and grasp katana of fury, for example. I don't know if that exists, but that's, that's an example. Or the, you know, the, the doom shout, um, holy chest plate of, power. Um, and so those doom bite and, and crack and grasp are parts of lores. There's the third lore that never comes out of the contract because it only gets assigned at greatness levels higher than anything that shows up in the loot thing. So what they've suggested is that, um, you know, if you had 8,000 loot bags and they were off, you know, doing adventures and quests and, you know, increasing their items and in greatness, they all stopped at 20. 
And that is the sort of the theory behind that there was a cataclysm that ended the loot verse as we know it. Um, and so when I say the Great War in the white paper, that's what we're referring to. So the closet, uh, the cataclysm is the end. That's right. Is that what you're saying? Is That's it, right. Yeah. It starts so from the end. Yeah. Very good okay. reasoning. And you can find more information if you go to uh, loot.foundation. Um, so when you're reading the banners white paper, you're kind of reading our deep dive into what we've done. If you go to loot foundation, you can get um, all of that level of detail on the, the loot verse itself. So there's a pretty compelling argument to be made that the world ends, which is also a really cool, um, cool idea that that we're operating in this thing that's you know racing towards uh, Armageddon. Um, within the items, that's it. there's that, there's you know, holy chest plates, ancient helms, etc. But there's a class of items called the divine. So there's divine robes, divine silk slippers, etc., um, etc. Et um, a bunch of early divine item owners got together and suggested that they were, you know, this group of people that, you know, would get together and, and, and do things. And so they, they created this, this project called the divine Tao, which has spawned the divine city. Um, and it's got its own sort of floating, um, floating city in the sky that, uh, you know, houses libraries and, and, and things like that. And they're, generally mages um but there's a whole bunch of sort of canonical and contract reasons for the existence of that as well um and you know they're working on uh, some projects too um and some writing and all kinds of stuff so those things they're all born from from the contract and if you go through the contract like there's all kinds of little little nuggets of 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 detail that come out um and then Tim Shell, who founded the Genesis Project, which is sort of the opposite end of the cataclysm. So if everything stopped increasing in greatness at 20 because of some, you know, worldwide catastrophe, the theory is that you could go back to greatness zero at the very beginning. And so what he's doing is um, taking the loot bags, you can distill them into their eight individual items or Genesis mana and then reassemble them at year zero, for lack of a better term, to create a Genesis adventurer of items that are all the same. So you could have, you know, the helm of the fox, the robe of the fox, the boots of the fox, the katana of the fox, etc. So there's uh, that timeline, um, and we've kind of set it at a thousand years just as a, a placeholder, but we've now got two points on, on a millennium um, and two sort of constructs of characters, the loot bags as they were minted out, which is a, a random hodgepodge of different orders and greatnesses and types of items. And, you know, some were mage and some were, you know, hunter, that kind of thing to the origin state where they were sort of all aligned by the order. And then connecting those two points over a thousand years gives you a lot of, you know, creative room to to expand and, and come up with reasons. So, you know, why did the Genesis Genesis adventurer of the Fox, um, why did their bag split up? You know, maybe they had kids and they bequeathed two items to each kid and they went on to find more items and, and you know, make a different collection of bag. Um, there's other theories that, um, one theory is called the, the you know, the Cognoscenti who who feared that the bags were having too much power over their owners and, and sought to destroy the bags, um, which, you know, potentially is a reason for the cataclysm. We still don't know what caused the cataclysm. Um, there's just all these really big questions, um, that have reasons for being asked from the original contract. And all of that is sort of narrative surface area to, to drill down and find more stories. And what we do with banners is introduce another layer of, you know, connective tissue to, to string all of that together. What I, what I find really interesting is that since everything is leading up to this great war and this great cataclysm, like it, it, it adds this added pressure to like the different guilds, because we all know that at some point there's going to be this great war 
and what's going to cause the great war? Is there going to be a strife between one of the houses? And, you know, because it's so, so open, it's, it's very interesting, like the different alliances that can be formed and, you know, the, the various, how, how society can structure itself, knowing that there's going to be a great war at the end. So that's, that's a very interesting um, added layer of suspense, I would say. For sure. It's, it's really neat for us, you know, as the people, you know, writing and building and thinking about those things to, to come up with reasons, you know, why the world might end. Um, but it's really cool when you get to the character level, like, you know, who knew about it? What did they know about it? What were they trying to do to stop it? What were they trying to do to start it? Um, there's a, just so many interesting questions uh, at the character level that I think there's going to be some really neat stuff come out uh, about that. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I um, think we should wrap it up. It's been very good uh, talking to you. Is there anything that you would like to to, to say before we uh, move out? Um, yeah. So I, I think I would check out our Twitter. So it's at Banners NFT. You can find connections for all of our stuff. We're going to have uh, another edition of Call the Banners, which is the free to play discord game. There's uh, a bunch of different loot verse prizes available. Um, it's all done by raffle. There's no, there's no gaming the system. It's, it's a social hangout. Um, and, and just sort of like a, a chaotic good time with, with some fun prizes if you happen to win the raffle. So be sure to check out the discord for that. Um, and we're, we're aiming to launch the painted banners, um, on Ethereum, uh, probably mid September. We're aiming for September 15th, right about now. If you hold one of the text only banners on Polygon, you'll be able to claim your painted banner that matches that um, in perpetuity. So there's no rush to do that. Um, and if you don't own a, a text only banner, you'll be able to mint one of the, the painted banners um, when they come out. We'll be sort of upgrading the contract to, to those as the, the, the main banners piece going forward. Um, but that's kind of it. I, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and diving into uh, to the loopers. It's we get these meetings and we everybody sort of has this you know same buzz coursing through their their bodies about you know what we're doing and why we're so excited about it. But it's it's fun to go outside and, and talk to other people uh, and you know hopefully you know spread the word a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean I've I've always been interested in the loopverse and you know, just this hour long conversation barely scratched the surface. So I've learned so much from this conversation. I've learned, I have a better understanding of like the text NFTs and how it relates to the realms and the various projects and how you guys are working together. And I'm sure there's like so much more that I can delve into. So I, I appreciate this conversation. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's really hard to, it's really hard to boil down, um, but discovering all those things is part of half, is, is really half the fun as well. So, if you're interested in like fantasy at all, whether it's games, books, movies, shows, um, tabletop RPGs, whatever it is, um, I would recommend just kind of checking out the loot first, and, and you'll be able to find your, you know, kind of find your place. Like we've got architects, accountants, lawyers, um, you know, small business guys, startup guys, um, computer guys, um, writers, artists, animators, there's any, any kind of background that you have in, in the real world as a very useful place, um, in the loop first. So come and, uh, come and get nerd sniped with us. I'm already nerd sniped. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, thanks for, thanks for being on our second episode of our podcast.